In the last video, we introduced the idea that photoexcitation generates diuretic alloyed type of structures. This often leads to bond cleavage events, particularly as primary photochemical processes. In this video, we're going to take a detailed look at the two types of bond cleavages in the most general terms possible that we can think of, sigma bond cleavage and pi bond cleavage. These happen in fundamentally different ways. Sigma bond cleavage is a bond lengthening while pi bond cleavage happens via a rotation process. And so the way the excited state evolves into a transition state and then on to the final products varies for these two processes. And they're the foundations of photo induced homolysis reactions in the case of sigma bond cleavage and cis-trans isomerization, which is a very important process for alkenes and other pi bond containing chromophores for which cis and trans isomers are possible. What these two primary processes have in common is that they both involve the conversion of an excited state molecule into some diuretic alloyed structure. And of course, the excited state itself may have diuretical character, diuretic alloyed character. And that diuretic alloyed can then often evolve into either a diuretic or a Zwitter ionic ground state structure. To understand the details of how this happens, we're going to consider three different aspects of the structural change occurring as this process takes place. First, we're going to think about how the orbitals evolve, how they change positions in space, and how that leads to changes in energies. Then we're going to look at the electronic states. These are, for example, the possible excited electronic states of our star, things like n pi star, pi pi star, possible states of the diuretic alloyed and singular triplet diuraticals and those different Zwitter ionic states with charge located at different positions. Those energies evolve as geometric change happens in these processes. And related to the point of electronic states, we're also going to consider electron configurations. How geometric change alters the possible electron configurations that can exist within the molecule or molecules as the sigma or pi bond cleaves. So let's start with sigma bond cleavage. As a sigma bond breaks, the atoms involved move apart from each other laterally along the bonding axis. And here we're using the prototypical example of H2, arguably the simplest sigma bond, right? As the two H's move farther apart from one another, we can imagine that as moving to the right on this graph with the bond length on the x-axis. And what we're looking at here are the energies of the sigma and sigma star orbitals as we move the hydrogens farther apart from one another. Before we get into the shapes of this graph, I'll just point out where we're going. At some point, we reach a, a structure where the bond is stretched, but the electrons are still interacting with each other. This is a classic diuretic alloyed. We're starting to get independent electron character near each hydrogen atom, but the electrons are still interacting quite strongly, and so this is really a diuretic alloyed rather than a pure diuretic. At the point where the bond is cleaved, well, now we're dealing with a classical diuretic with the two unpaired electrons acting more or less completely independently. For example, the singlet and triplet states become equal in energy, and the electrons kind of don't know the other one is there, don't know the other one exists. The evolutions of the orbitals, I think, follow fairly intuitively from this model. In the H2 molecule, we have a sigma bonding orbital and a sigma star antibonding orbital, and they are quite far separated in energy because of the strong interaction between the 1s orbitals on each of the hydrogen atoms in the intact H2 molecule. Those interactions get weaker as the hydrogens move apart from one another, and we reach this kind of gray area where we're in the diuretic oid region right about, say, here. And at some point, there's a critical geometry, let's call that RC, a critical bond length, where basically there is no interaction. And we've gone from energetically distinct sigma bonding and sigma star antibonding orbitals to equivalent or degenerate 1s orbitals on either hydrogen atom. And of course, as we move farther out to the right, these interact less and less and less, and way out here, we are absolutely at a diuretical structure with independently acting electrons on two really hydrogen atoms now separated far in space. I'll make the point now, and, and you should assume it for everything else we'll talk about in this video, that this evolution of the orbital energies is really an exemplar for 
any sigma bond cleavage process. BRBR, CLCL, carbon iodine, any photochemically induced bond cleavage process has an evolution of orbital energies that looks like this. So it's a general picture that is very much worth keeping in mind. When we think through the possible electron configurations for the reactant and the products here, the intact H2 molecule's possible electron configurations just reflect excitations of the electrons to the sigma star orbital in various ways. So S0 has no electrons in the sigma star orbital, sigma 2. T1 is a triplet sigma sigma star state, S1 a singlet si sigma sigma star state, and S2 is a singlet sigma star 2 state where both electrons have been promoted to the sigma antibonding orbital. The situation changes profoundly when the two H atoms are separated because now there are no bonding interactions so that we have the possibility of either both electrons remaining unpaired with parallel spins like this on the separate H atoms. This would be a triplet D configuration, for example. Let's actually write that out down here. We have H up and H up would be a triplet D configuration. We can have H up and H down. So again, the electrons are still separated in space, still engaged with the separated H atoms, but now their spins are anti-parallel rather than parallel. And we can also think about Z1 and Z2 states with both electrons living on one of the hydrogen atoms. This would be negatively charged and no electrons on the other hydrogen. And Z2 is simply the opposite situation with both electrons on the other hydrogen atom up and down. Now the negative charge is over here and the positive charge is here. And because of the pairing and the repulsion, electron-electron repulsion associated with that pairing, the Z states are higher in energy than the D states. These are the possible electron configurations. Now what we can do is connect these possible electron configurations via a state correlation diagram that essentially links the possible states of the reactant in a continuous way with the possible states of the product, evoking this idea of a continuous potential energy surface connecting, for example, the T1 state to the triplet diradical. And we won't talk about in detail how to generate these state correlation diagrams using the idea that this will basically be an exemplar for any sigma bond cleavage process. And we'll talk through why each of these has the shape that it does. So now what we've done is we've taken those electron configurations, those possible states from the last slide, and laid them down on a graph where we've connected the reactant states with the product states via continuous lines. Each of these lines is a potential energy surface, and that's a point that I want to emphasize. And so everything we've talked about previously with respect to potential energy surfaces is going to apply to these graphs. For example, anywhere where you see a well corresponds to a stable species with finite lifetime. The lowest curve here in blue is simply the ground state potential energy surface. This is the equilibrium bond length for the H2 molecule, and as we pull the H's apart, this state raises in energy until we essentially reach the completely separated singlet or triplet diradical. For the triplet state, there is no equilibrium geometry because the electrons have parallel spins. As they move farther and farther apart from one another, electron, electron repulsion decreases, and there is no stable structure for triplet sigma sigma star hydrogen. And this is true of any triplet sigma sigma star molecule. The triplet state always moves downhill in energy as the atoms of the bond move apart. The S2 state, for a similar reason, always moves downhill in energy as we move toward a Z state. Occupation of an antibonding orbital with two electrons is essentially going to push the atoms away from one another, as it was described to me a long time ago in very vivid terms. Uh, this occupation of the antibonding orbital actually has a profound destabilizing effect on the molecules such that separating the atoms, even giving one of those atoms both of the electrons, will stabilize the molecule overall. S1, the singlet sigma sigma star state, actually has an energy minimum. And the reason for this has to do with the fact that in order to reach a Zwitter ionic state, we actually have to transfer an electron, say from the sigma orbital to the sigma star orbital or vice versa. And that electron transfer generates a polarization. And so while the bond is getting weaker, which causes a movement upward in energy, the polarization, 
the partial positive and partial negative charges induced by this electron transfer process cause a stabilizing effect. And at some point, those two effects balance each other and we reach an energy minimum. However, this tends to be very shallow and very often will go right on to the Z1 or Z2 state very quickly. And of course, Z1 and Z2 are degenerate in the, in the case of H2 or any homonuclear um, bond like this with the same atoms involved. For different atoms, Z2 might be lower in energy than Z1 or, or vice versa. That's actually where we're going on the next slide where we look at a polar sigma bond with X and Y being different atoms. The key difference there is that the energies of the Z states are now different and things actually get a little bit complicated. Because the sigma star orbital is predominantly located on the less electronegative atom, let's call it X. Let's say that in the ground state structure, the bond is polarized toward Y so that X is the less electronegative atom. The sigma star orbital is polarized towards X. This means that exciting both electrons to the sigma star orbital tends to put them on X such that X is correlated with the Z state with the negative charge on the less electronegative atom. So S2, that sigma star 2 state, is correlated with putting both electrons, for example, on the carbon of a carbon iodine bond. S1 is correlated with the lower energy Z state, since most of the electron density is still on the more electronegative atom, iodine, when we only excite one of the two electrons to the sigma star orbital. And so the typical situation is for S1 to, involve, to evolve to a Z1 state where the bond is polarized with positive charge on the less electronegative atom and negative charge on the more electronegative atom.